Lots of you have asked me to cover modafinil and our modafinil. So here it is. You've probably heard the hype, a pill that keeps you alert for hours. No coffee crashes, no jittery buzz, just sharp focus. That's the promise of modafinil, the so-called smart drug. But here's the reality. It doesn't work the way most people think. And its cousin, our modafinil, is even more misunderstood. So in this video, we're going to cut through the hype. I'll explain how these drugs really work in the brain, where they help, where they don't, and why understanding the neuroscience matters more than the headlines. So let's start off with the contrast. Popular culture says modafinil is a limitless pill, a shortcut to genius. But neuroscience says otherwise. Modafinil isn't a miracle smart drug. It's a wake-promoting agent, a huge heroic. It stabilizes arousal by nudging multiple brain systems at once. So here's my plan for this video. First, we'll trace where these drugs came from. Then, the key difference between modafinil and our modafinil. Next, we'll dive into the neuroscience, dopamine, norepinephrine, orexin, histamine, and GABA. Then, the clinical uses, the off-label hype, and finally, the risks and controversies. I'll show you the actual science, not the Silicon Valley sales pitch. I'm Dr. Sunil Rege, consultant, psychiatrist, and educator. I've used modafinil and our modafinil for a long time. And in order to maximize its potential, it's important to understand the neuroscience. So let's start off with the backstory. France, 1970s. Researchers are testing a drug called adrafinil. It was meant to keep animals awake. But here's the twist. Adrafinil itself wasn't doing the heavy lifting. Once metabolized in the liver, it produced modafinil, the active ingredient. By the 1990s, modafinil was approved for narcolepsy, a condition where people can suddenly fall asleep in the middle of daily life. Later, the approvals extended to shift work, sleep disorder, and residual sleepiness in obstructive sleep apnea. That's the official story. But unofficially, surgeons, students, pilots, even entire militaries started experimenting with modafinil. Why? Because if you can keep a soldier awake for 40 hours without amphetamines, that's a game changer. So modafinil's reputation quickly moved from the clinic to the culture of performance enhancement. And that's where our modafinil enters the picture, the refined cousin. We'll get to that in just a moment. Modafinil is what we call a racemic mixture. That means it's made up of two mirror image molecules, the R enantiomer and the S enantiomer. Both are active, but not equally. The R enantiomer sticks around longer, giving more sustained effects. The S enantiomer clears faster. So when you take modafinil, you're really getting a blend. But R modafinil is different. It's pure R enantiomer. Think of it as the refined version. Longer half-life, smoother curve, fewer afternoon crashes. This subtle shift from racemic to single enantiomer is why patients sometimes describe R modafinil as steadier, with less up and down. But chemistry only explains part of the story. The real intrigue comes when we look at how these drugs interact with the brain's arousal systems. And here's the surprising part. They don't act like the stimulants you already know, methylphenidate or dexamphetamine. Most people assume modafinil works just like amphetamines. Just crank up dopamine, get wired, done. That's not the case. So let's break it down system by system. First, dopamine. Yes, modafinil and our modafinil inhibit the dopamine transporter, DAT. That increases extracellular dopamine but the effect is milder compared to cocaine or amphetamines. That's why you don't get the same euphoria or the same addictive profile. Two, norepinephrine. Modafinil also boosts norepinephrine, especially in the hypothalamus. This adds to arousal and vigilance. Third, orexin, also known as hypocretin. Now this is the fascinating part. Orexin neurons in the hypothalamus are like the brain's master switch for wakefulness. Loss of orexin leads to narcolepsy. So modafinil and our modafinil activate these neurons, effectively stabilizing wakefulness. But it doesn't stop there. We've got the fourth neurotransmitter effect, histamine. Modafinil increases histamine release in the brain. Histamine isn't just for allergies. It also keeps you awake. This is why antihistamines can make you drowsy. Fifth, GABA. Modafinil reduces GABA transmission, the brain's main inhibitory signal. Less GABA, more arousal. So modafinil is a conductor, a modulator, nudging dopamine, noradrenaline, orexin, histamine, and GABA to create a symphony 
of wakefulness. So let's now bring it back to clinical practice. Where do these medications actually help? First, narcolepsy. For many, life-changing. They can function again. Two, shift work sleep disorder. Staying awake on the night shift without crashing the next day. Third, obstructive sleep apnea. Even after CPAP treatment, some patients feel sleepy. Modafinil and armodafinil helps fill that gap. But outside these diagnoses, the story gets more complex. In fact, let's now look at the off-label world, depression and ADHD. Here's where hype and hope collide. In depression, where patients have fatigue and hypersomnia, these agents can add a benefit to antidepressants. Some report improved energy and focus. In ADHD, it has been trialed, but stimulants like methylphenidate and dexamphetamine remain first line. Modafinil and armodafinil are sometimes considered when stimulants aren't tolerated. Now here's an important aspect to recognize. Narcolepsy can be highly comorbid with ADHD, especially type two narcolepsy. I've covered ADHD and sleep disorders in this article here. And we've also got a precision sleep medicine course and the neuropsychiatry of sleep course on the Academy by Psychscene. So for clinicians, you can check this out here. You see, there is a specific phenotype known as ADHD SOM, where sleep disorders dominate. And therefore, treatment of ADHD SOM is different from ADHD without SOM. At the start of the video, I talked about these agents considered as smart drugs. They're considered smart drugs because they're used as cognitive enhancers in healthy people. This is where things get messy. Students pulling off all-nighters, executives pushing 16-hour days. The evidence is mixed. Some studies show modest improvements in executive function. Others show little difference. And side effects like insomnia or anxiety can cancel out the gains. If agents such as modafinil or armodafinil or stimulants are used to enhance performance, we can enter into the realm of performance debt, which essentially means we're borrowing to enhance performance. In some individuals, this can result in burnout, where a time comes where we've got to pay back that debt. Here's the video that talks about burnout and performance debt. So when we think about the idea of a limitless pill, that's fiction. Now let's talk about what often gets ignored, the risks. Common side effects include headaches, nausea, insomnia, and anxiety. Rare but serious side effects include severe skin reactions like Steven Johnson syndrome. Now there is an addiction potential, much lower than stimulants, but not zero. And here's the controversy. Should healthy people use modafinil for performance? The benefits are modest, the risks are real, and the long-term safety is uncertain. So the jury is out. Clinically, my view is this. They are very useful tools for sleep disorders. They're potentially useful adjuncts in psychiatry when we target the appropriate domains, but they're not shortcuts to genius or enhancing performance. And this brings us to the bigger picture. What do these drugs really teach us about the brain? The big picture is that modafinil and armodafinil are not miracle smart drugs. They're sophisticated wake promoting agents. They don't flood the brain with dopamine. Instead, they orchestrate multiple arousal systems, dopamine, norepinephrine, orexin, histamine, and GABA. Armodafinil is essentially the refined version, longer lasting and smoother. Clinically, they've transformed lives in narcolepsy and related disorders. Psychiatrically, they offer intriguing adjunct roles, but culturally, they've been oversold. If you found this breakdown useful, hit the like button and subscribe to the channel. And if you're a clinician who wants to go deeper into psychopharmacology and neuroscience, check out our psychopharmacology masterclass at the Academy by Psychscene. Because there's no such thing as a magic pill, but there is such a thing as deeper understanding. And that's what changes practice. I'm Dr. Sunil Rege, and I look forward to seeing you in the next video. Until then, stay curious. Bye-bye.